This is a journey of self-discovery. I want to find out why ordinary people like you and I are capable of doing extraordinary things. Why we risk danger, even death, for the sake of another. Why did this woman make the ultimate sacrifice? What made this soldier run into a hail of bullets? What gave these two men the courage to rescue a complete stranger? In our quest to understand our instincts to help others, we'll find out how we're programmed to love and protect our children from birth. <coughs> we'll travel across the globe to discover the surprising instincts we share with gruesome vampires. With intriguing experiments, we'll reveal how millions of years of evolution have made us generous to our families. And I'll have my brain probe to learn how human beings can read each other's minds. And we'll go right to the edge of our scientific knowledge to understand how the most uniquely human instinct has helped us to become the most successful species on the planet. The instinct to put others first. The story begins here, in this beautiful part of southern France. The Gorge de la Nesque in Provence was once home to early humans. The relics these first inhabitants left have been gradually uncovered by scientists over the last 15 years. Recently they've made an extraordinary discovery, the earliest evidence of human kindness and I'm on my way to see it for myself. Two hundred thousand years ago, in this stunning gorge, early humans settled in the overhangs of cliffs. And it's in one of these rock shelters that archaeologists unearthed their remarkable find. This tiny fossil has a huge story to tell. It's the right half of an early human jawbone, and we can see that the teeth fell out while this human was still alive. As eaters of tough meat, this would have meant certain starvation, a death sentence. But for this person, help was at hand. What makes this toothless jawbone, which was lain here for 200,000 years, unique is that this person must have been fed soft or pre-chewed food for weeks on end, allowing time for new bone to form over the empty sockets. And that kindness saved this person's life. We humans alone have evolved this remarkable instinct to help others more vulnerable than ourselves. Canada, that instinct to help others was put to the ultimate test when a mother was called upon to protect her son. Stephen Parolin is lucky to be alive. Six years ago, he set off on a camping trip into the remote mountain forest with his brother, his mother, and sister, Melissa. It was pretty exciting. In the morning, I felt a bit nervous and like, something bad was going to happen or something, but I kind of shoved it aside and I was feeling pretty happy when we got going. They had almost reached the campsite when, without warning, the horses began to snort and rear. Something was wrong. 
I saw this head poke out of the trees on the left side of me, and I thought, oh, it's just a coyote. And then it came on, it's kind of, they have very sleek movements, and he just kind of like glided it out, and I kind of looked at it and I went, that's not a coyote. In fact, it was a cougar, a mountain lion, capable of killing prey twice its size. The cougar went straight for Stephen. It didn't even look at the rest of us. It just went directly towards Stephen. Sat its paws right on the saddle. Huge eyes just sitting there staring at me. And then... Face to face with death, six-year-old Stephen didn't stand a chance. Stephen kind of fell off. And then as he was standing up, the cougar um, reached around his head like this with his paws and just ripped open his head. Seeing her son in terrible danger, his mother, Cindy, reacted without hesitation. With a primal scream, she launched herself at the cougar to fight for her son. It was just like instinct, you know. I guess she figured that she'd be OK or she didn't really think about it. it was just a reaction to what was happening. Mum, Cindy, broke off a branch and with almost superhuman strength, wrestled the cougar to the ground. Locked in combat, she ordered the two older children to take Stephen to safety. It would be some time before they found help. With Stephen safe, his brother returned to the forest to search for his mother with family friend Jim Mannion. I had to move over about three or four feet, took a couple steps to my right, and there was the cat, and the head of the cat was right over top of Cindy's head. When they found Cindy, she was barely alive. She'd been wrestling with the cougar for over two hours. Jim took his gun and shot the cougar. Despite terrible injuries, Cindy had clung on to life. I really believe that she kept herself alive to see what had happened to her children. And I think after hearing that her children were safe, then she just at that point said, hey, it is time to go. Cindy died of her wounds on the way to the hospital. The instinct to protect her children led her to make the ultimate sacrifice. The happy part is, is knowing that my mom was brave and, and that she was willing enough to do anything for us kids. The sad part is, is that I think that she's gone now. And I'm never gonna see her again. In saving her son, Cindy demonstrated the most powerful heroic instinct we know, the mother's drive to protect her young. Human beings have evolved to feel deeply protective towards their children. It seems perfectly natural, but it might have been very different. Unlike most animals, humans usually have just one baby at a time, which makes each of our offspring uniquely precious. Which is why we invest so much in our children and are prepared to go to such unparalleled lengths to protect them. <laughs> Millions of years of evolution have made us all loving parents. Right from the moment of birth, our brains and bodies help us bond instinctively with a newborn child. The key to making that happen is a hormone we humans share with all other mammals. It's called oxytocin. It has immediate and powerful effects. The new mum becomes hyper aware of her baby. Her senses appear to work faster and more keenly. The release of oxytocin has been triggered in a primitive part of the brain, the hypothalamus. 
And this gives mum a powerful urge to feed her baby. And that suckling sets off nerve impulses in the nipple which travel up to the mother's brain, triggering her reward center and so creating a natural high. Mum soon learns to recognize the unique smell of her baby. And each time she smells the baby, more oxytocin is released. Bonding and nurturing behaviors in men seem to be stimulated by a chemical that's very similar to oxytocin, vasopressin. It's released from the same primitive area of the brain. And new fathers also have a nose for their newborn baby. The scent induces a feeling of calm and can make men less aggressive. It's a powerful effect, the result of millions of years of evolution. The drive to protect our young is shared by many other animals. Like us, they've inherited strong parenting instincts from generations of successful mums and dads. Biologically, it makes sense to look after your offspring. On average, each one shares half your genes. That means if you successfully raise two young, it's rather like passing on 100% of your own genetic material into the next generation. It's the closest we get to immortality. But for many species, this instinct goes further. Take these meerkats. They will even protect youngsters that are not their own. These adult meerkats babysit their nieces and nephews. They literally stick their necks out in search of predators. What they do is dangerous. They could attract unwelcome attention themselves. So why take the risk? Well, it makes sense. These little nieces and nephews share a quarter of their genes with their aunties. So looking after two of them, in biological terms, is as good as having their own child. <laughs> These family values in animals always stick to a golden rule. The more genes family members share, the more they'll do for each other. But the big question is, are we humans the same? Meet the Gavin family of Essex, England. They're about to take part in an unusual experiment to test their instincts. My name's Elf, and I'm father to Kim and Lisa. I'm Lisa, and Philip and Becky are my children. I'm Becky, and Kim's my aunt. My name's Kim, I'm mum to Helena, Matthew and Heather, auntie to Philip and Rebecca, and sister to Lisa. Just like the animals, the closer the Gavins are on the family tree, the more genes they share. And if they obey our golden rule, the more they should do for each other. Here's the test. We're challenging them to hold their breath underwater for as long as they can. The longer they do it, the more money they will earn for one of their relatives. I've got Philip. And who's Philip? He's my nephew. According to biology's golden rule, they should hold their breath longer for people who are most closely related, sharing the highest proportion of their genes. First off, Alf holds his breath for his granddaughter, Becky, with whom he shares a quarter of his genes. He manages just 16 seconds. When he holds his breath for his two daughters, with whom he shares half his genes, he does much better. 22 seconds for Lisa, and 21 for Kim. Now it's Heather's turn. First she holds her breath for her auntie Lisa, who shares a quarter of her genes. The result, 51 seconds. Good work. Next is her more distant relative, 
cousin Becky with only an eighth of her genes. As predicted, a lower 47 seconds. But watch what happens when Heather takes the plunge for her very close relative, brother Matt. A whopping 72 seconds. It makes sense. They share half their genes. Scientists have repeated this experiment on a number of families. Results show that when it comes to being generous, there really is a natural pecking order. People put themselves out more to help people who are more closely related. So without thinking about it, the Gavins obey this golden rule of biology. But some families are far from harmonious. Bitter rivalry between relatives would suggest that the golden rule doesn't always apply. Take the English kings during the War of the Roses. This is the Tower of London, home to gruesome scenes of torture and execution through the centuries. Between 1300 to 1600, the facilities here were put to particularly good use by various members of the royal family as they fought each other for the throne. In those days, the quickest way to seize power was to bump off your nearest and dearest. Scientists decided to study this bloody period to find out what becomes of the golden rule. If families are keen to help their closest gene-sharing relatives, are they also keen to avoid harming them and wiping out a proportion of their own genes? At first sight, it would appear not. Take the case of the brutal murder of the Duke of Clarence, who met a sticky end in 1478. Rumour has it that Clarence was drowned in a butt of Malmsey wine here at the tower. What's certain is that the man behind his death was none other than his very own brother, Edward IV. Now, killing your own brother is a biologically dangerous thing to do when you consider that he shares half your genes. That's half your own genetic value down the drain. But it turns out that Edward IV was a particularly bloodthirsty king. He also got rid of six of his cousins. But these were distant cousins, and their genetic value to Edward was small. So when the scientists totaled up the value of all the genes he'd destroyed, they found that Edward was not as reckless as he seems. What's truly surprising is, it still doesn't quite make one whole Edward. There's still a little left. Edward never spilled quite enough blood to wipe out 100% of his own genetic value. And in fact, Throughout this bloody period of English royal history, nor did any other monarch. It's almost as if they kept the formula in their heads by instinct, even to secure the hotly contested throne for themselves and their children, it seems there were precise limits to the bloodthirstiness of these cutthroat royals. However ruthless the monarch, their instincts held their ambition in check. It's easy to understand why we might instinctively protect members of our family. But there are times when human beings are capable of the most heroic actions for their friends. Is it possible that we've evolved instincts that encourage us to do this? These men have a bond that makes them feel like brothers. It was forged under the most extreme circumstances after the heroic actions of this man Al Raskin. We bestow the medal knowing that America would not have survived were it not for people like him, who generation after generation have always renewed the extraordinary gift of freedom. Medic Al Raskin and his friend Neil Haffey were just teenagers when they went to Vietnam. But what happened there, neither would ever forget.
It was the 16th of March, 1966, and the young soldiers were close to enemy lines in a reconnaissance platoon. It was a very tense time. We saw a lot of troop movement in the area. We uncovered a big cache of weapons. I'm talking tons of weapons. It was as though you were blowing up a balloon just waiting for it to pop. They spotted an enemy machine gun nest up ahead, and Neil Haffey opened fire. As soon as I got one round into it, um, all hell broke loose. Machine gun fire was going off, small arms were going off, hand grenades were being thrown at each other. The squad was pinned down. Neil watched powerless as a close friend was killed just a few feet away. I just lost it. I just stood up, starting to run over to where he was. At that point, this enemy soldier, as close as you are to me, shot me point blank. Seeing Neil badly wounded, Al Raskin jumped up and rushed towards him, ignoring a hail of bullets. And as I'm trying to get towards Haffey, hand grenades are thrown at him. One landed maybe three or four feet away from me. And uh, I thought it was my turn to go. I thought definitely I was going to be dead within the next couple of seconds. And uh, I remember just turning my head because I didn't want to see death coming. With his friend in mortal danger, Al Raskin made a split-second life and death decision. You're looking at a person that you know, and you have no other choice than to take care of that person. Whether your life is going to be taken away, you don't know. I was expecting the grenade to go off any second. I was just closing my eyes and waiting for it, and all of a sudden this heavy weight just jumped right on top of me, and it was stuck. I had no choice but to cover him with my body. Al used his own body to shield his friend. Taking the full force of the grenade blast himself, Al was so badly wounded that the chaplain gave him his last rites. I think there are things that are done out of instinct, things you can't come back and plan for. It's not a, a condition where you have the, the privilege to come back and think about it. It's something you just do. I believe Doc was going on instinct and adrenaline when he was doing all this. He wasn't thinking. I think even a medic of Doc's caliber, if he would have thought it out, he wouldn't have done it. Thirty years later, Al Raskin was given the Medal of Honor. I'm very thankful for what Al did. You know, I, I've had a good life so far. I've had a good career. I have a beautiful family. Been places I never would have been able to go dead. <laughs> so I can't thank him enough. You know, I try, but I can't. Al risked his own life to save his friend. He believes he did it on instinct. But why would instincts to protect people who are not related to us have evolved? Scientists have found clues that help us understand why we all have instincts to help our friends. The evidence lies half a world away with a particularly bloodthirsty animal. Here, in the jungles of Costa Rica, there lives a remarkable species of mammal which is closer to us than you might like to think. Life is very tough for these animals indeed, but they found a method of coping which sets them apart. They help each other, and they do this by swapping something really rather gruesome. This behavior is almost unique in the animal kingdom, but it's crucial to their survival, and they live here in the rainforest beneath me. In this large hollowed tree, there live several different species of bat. And in a few minutes, as it begins to get dark, 
they'll fly out and look for food. Now the species of bat that I'm interested in doesn't live on fruit or insects, which is usual. They have a slightly more exotic diet. These bats inspired a gothic horror story. And just like the mythical monster, they are creatures of the night. So we filmed them with a night vision camera to get really close to them. It's obvious from his teeth what this bat feeds on. This is a colony of vampires. They drink blood and they're hungry. Oh, you vicious brute. Look at your evil face. I'm going to let you go. Despite their Dracula-like fangs, feasting on blood is not as easy as it sounds. Just like the fictional character, real vampires have only a few short hours to feed before dawn. The victims are often farm animals. Gruesome as this may look, the sleeping victim is unaware. The bat's saliva numbs the wound, whilst ensuring a steady flow of blood. It's four o'clock in the morning, and the vampires are flying home. Hopefully, they all will have found food. These animals have a very rapid metabolism, so just 48 hours without a meal means certain death. But this is where these resourceful creatures come into their own. For those unlucky enough to come home still hungry, help is at hand. The vampires live in small groups that have evolved to cooperate. One bat will regurgitate blood for another bat who's failed to find food. This generosity makes a dramatic difference to the survival chances of the whole colony. But beware any bat who takes blood and refuses to return the favor. They'll be remembered and shunned in future. This kind of generous behavior is exceptionally rare. In fact, vampire bats are one of the only species ever found that remembers favors for more than a brief fleeting moment, except for we humans, of course. Thank you. As animals go, we humans are really very generous indeed. In fact, we are naturally the most generous of animals by far. Most of us would think nothing of lending somebody the money for lunch, or buying a round of drinks in the pub. But exactly like the bats, when we're generous, our instincts are crying out for us to be repaid. Cheers. After all, being generous might backfire. We could leave ourselves vulnerable to people who take, but don't give in return. It's pretty annoying being conned out of a pint of beer. But there was rather more at stake for our distant ancestors. In the harsh prehistoric world of early humans, not being repaid could mean starvation and death. Somebody must have been generous to the owner of this jawbone. Left to themselves, they would have starved as their teeth fell out. But if there was an instinct to help others, thousands of generations ago, there had to be something else. Generosity could only have evolved if early humans had just as keen an instinct to detect somebody who was simply on the take, a cheat. We all have a powerful gut reaction when we feel we're being treated unfairly. It's an instinct that's with us from childhood. Thank mm -hmm. you.
In this experiment, seven and eight-year-olds are sharing a stash of ten chocolate coins. One child decides on how they are split, and they can offer as many or as few coins as they like. I'm going to give her two. You get three. So you get one. You get three. At first, they keep more for themselves, but there's a catch. It's the other child who gets to decide if the split's fair. If not, they can refuse the offer. And then, both children have to go away empty-handed. Will they get away with it? No. I said no. 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 What do you mean? That means you don't get any chocolate. I don't care. It's already too little. Almost all of the children reject a smaller share, preferring to have nothing at all. It may seem strange, but it's not. By going without themselves, they're punishing their partner who loses even more chocolate. And they're not going to forget that in a hurry. Look what happens when the experiment is repeated. She gets five and I get five. OK. You get four. OK, I got to give you five coins for you and five for me. I'm going to give you four. Now, with a fairer split, what will the response be? Yes. I'll say yes this time. Ooh! Mm, yeah. Yes. The children are happy to accept. It's not difficult to see why we've evolved this way. If we react instinctively against people who cheat, they'll think twice before trying it again. This instinctive taste for fairness leaves humans free to help one another. All of us have the instinct to help other people. Watch how unsuspecting shoppers react when they see our stump man take a fall. When they see him in trouble or in pain, they react with compassion. It's as if they feel the same pain too. Sure, right. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Are you okay? right. They're experiencing a particularly human instinct called empathy. Never mind, sweetheart. Yeah. Scientists in Italy are probing the brain to find out how we are able to put ourselves in other people's shoes. The team here have devised an experiment to show how the brain does something truly amazing. It reads other people's minds. The experiment involves magnifying the brain signals responsible for imitation. But to show how it works, the scientists need a human volunteer. So here goes. Recently, they've discovered a special set of brain cells. They're called mirror neurons, and what they do is remarkable. The theory is that when I see someone performing an action, my mirror neurons should try to copy the action too. But normally, this effect is so subtle I'm not even aware of it. The mirror neurons alone can't actually make my hand move, so to reveal them working, I need a little help. This equipment uses a powerful magnetic field to amplify the effect of my mirror neurons. But first, they have to find exactly the right spot in my brain. Nothing? You sort of fry my brain, don't you? <laughs> We're on target. Right, now we come to the crunch. We'll see what happens when I watch the video screen. If the mirror neurons are working, when I watch the picture of the hand grasping, my hand should twitch. Yeah, I felt a twitch. Yes, it may be just a small movement, but my hand's actually moving without any conscious help from me. And this reveals something amazing. 
Our brains are programmed to mimic the actions of other people. So my hand moved then when it wouldn't have done before, but because I was watching the picture exactly. and empathising with what I could see, exactly. my hand moved. This pioneering work leads some scientists to believe that our mirror neurons don't just imitate what other people do, but perhaps even how they feel. Empathy is so important to us that we are all born with a highly specialised mechanism to help share our feelings. The human face. The anatomy of the human face is unique in the animal kingdom. 47 muscles working together to reveal our emotions. Joy. Anger. Sadness. Disgust. We express our feelings in our faces spontaneously, and our expressions are the same the world over. But why should millions of years of evolution have left us with such a sophisticated tool for empathy? Hey, hey. Well, knowing what someone else is feeling can be very useful. Like whether they're pleased to see us or not. Give me some. Just as we're hardwired to express our emotions in our faces, so we're hardwired to receive them from other people loud and clear. We don't even have to think about it, we can just feel it. And evolving this instinct to empathize with others gave our ancestors a huge advantage. Watching these actors' faces, we sense what they're going through without having to be put in the same situation ourselves. Empathy is a highly effective but very primitive form of communication. But it doesn't stop there. Some scientists believe that empathy was the forerunner of another human instinct, the instinct for language. Just like the cinema, early communication was wordless. And like the movies, we took a great leap forward when we evolved talkies. Now you know everything. We'll start all over, together. Our ability to communicate through language is the most sophisticated instinct we possess, and it's inbuilt in every one of us. Nine months ago, Jasper was just a tiny screaming infant. He relied on his survival instincts to make sure he got all the attention he needed, love, care, comfort, and of course, food. Now, another instinct is causing something remarkable to happen. Jasper is making his very first attempts to talk. In less than a year, he has already mastered the full range of vowel sounds of his native tongue. Children have an instinct for language. They acquire it with barely any effort. In a few short years, Jasper will be as fluent as these four-year-olds. Every culture throughout the world communicates through speech. Our instinct for language put our species in the fast lane. As Jasper grows and learns to talk, he'll be able to share his experiences. And like his far distant ancestors, he'll exchange new ideas, convey the past, 
and mould the future. Thanks to our instinct for language, young Jasper will access the wisdom of generations. The accumulated knowledge of the human race means that we are all standing on the shoulders of giants. Language has helped us explore our planet and beyond. But this isn't the end of the story. We're not slaves to our instincts. As human beings, we learn, we reason, and we choose. Until September the 11th, 2001, Mike Benfanti and John Sakira were regular office workers. But on that day, they struggled with conflicting instincts and a series of life and death decisions, but still found the courage to help someone in great danger. Tina Hansen was working as usual on the 68th floor of the North Tower of the World Trade Center. In one second, my life was normal. And in the very next second, the, the building behaved in a way that I had never felt before. Up on the 81st floor, Mike and John were just below the point of impact. I guess it felt like an earthquake. And I saw flames shoot down above, from above and debris falling. We looked out the window and Saw some pretty horrible things. Saw some, I guess, maybe some bodies and, and clothes and things. Containing rising panic, Mike and John began to evacuate down the fire escape. On their way down, they came across Tina and two others in an empty office, struggling with Tina's emergency wheelchair. All of a sudden, this guy started banging on the front door. I looked behind the glass doors, and there were these women just standing there. And I was like, this doesn't make sense. you got to get moving here. They'd never met Tina before, but could see she needed help. Mike and John decided to carry her down the 68 floors to safety. There was no hesitation on their part. They didn't even seem to think twice about it. Putting aside their own need to escape, Mike and John chose instead to help Tina and get her out of danger. You don't know what's going through your mind. You're not thinking, OK, I'm going to be carrying this person down 68 flights. It was just instinct. I mean, it was just reaction. Mike and John carried Tina down flight after flight. Then almost an hour into the grueling descent, a fireman offered them a chance to leave Tina at an evacuation station on the 18th floor. My first reaction was to agree to that. But before I could get the words out of my mouth, um, Michael said, no, we've come this far. We're, we're going to take it all the way. I looked at John, and John looked at me, and he's like, all right, let's, you know, we're not letting go. And, and we did it. I went along with his instinct, uh, even though mine was different. I would have waited on the 18th floor. Um, and I, I probably would not have gotten out in time. As they descended, falling debris had blocked the stairwell, and the lights failed, plunging everything into darkness. We couldn't see where we were going. And then we'd have to move this debris and pick her up and carry her over. And we'd go one way, and there was no way out. We'd go another way, we couldn't get out. And now panic is starting to set in more, and people are becoming more frantic. It was almost like you were staring death right in the face. 
But uh, even at that point, not knowing if we were going to get out, there still wasn't the option in my mind to, to leave Tino. After battling for over an hour, they finally made their way out of the building just in time. Tina was driven away in an ambulance to safety only two minutes before the North Tower collapsed. I was just so relieved. I was so grateful, mostly, um, to, the, to you know everybody I had met along the way who had just been there for me, even though they didn't know me from Eve, you know. In the darkest of hours, Mike and John have put their own survival instinct aside and emerged as heroes. It was amazing because that was probably the worst situation or the one situation where you can make an excuse to say, OK, I'm just going to think about myself and I don't really have to worry about anybody else. But that's not what happened. I could have been another victim of other human beings who were who were carrying out mass murder on that day. Um, but because I was fortunate enough to meet women and men who acted on other impulses, uh, I was not another casualty. John and Mike were spurred on by the instincts we all share to help others. But their extraordinary heroism reveals a strength of character that instinct alone cannot explain. We've been on a fascinating journey across the world and deep into our past to discover our extraordinary human instincts. What's astonished me is that the urges and drives we've inherited from prehistoric men and women are still such a powerful force in our modern lives. Millions of years of evolution still compel us to survive to have children and to compete. And from those same prehistoric roots came instincts that define us as human beings. We've developed instincts for language and for helping others that go far beyond any other animal. Humans are so successful because we have more instincts, not less. And it's our amazing instincts which make us the most extraordinary species on the planet. Human beings. Yeah.